session we're going to take a look at using timelines to teach grammar. Timelines are a visual tool that we provide or we build for students so that they can better understand the actions that are represented by the different verb tenses in English. So in this session I'm going to start by giving you some tips or just some ideas for how to get started when you're drawing your timelines for students. Then we're going to take a look at each one of the verb tenses in English in turn and what timelines for those verb tenses might look like. So let's get started. A timeline is simply a way that we can represent how an event looks in terms of time uh, with a particular verb tense. So a timeline starts first of all by placing, by creating a single point in time that we use as our reference point. And that point is always now. So we're going to start with indicating on the board now. Here's where now is happening. And then we draw a horizontal line that indicates the passage of time. And then over this side we're going to label our past and over this side we're going to label our future. So here's now, here's the past, and then here's the future. That's the first thing we do when we're constructing any timeline. So, so far we've represented our three elements of time on our timeline. We've got our past, we've got our now or our present, and we've got our future. The next thing that we have to represent is the aspect. Aspect, if you recall, is the type of event that is occurring. And there's three main types of events that we need to represent visually somehow on our timelines. The first of these is a single event at a specific point in time. So the easiest way to represent this on a timeline is with an X. Okay? Some people like to represent it with an up and down line on top of the line, but this unfortunately can get confused with our representation of the present or the now. So this is actually not that good of an option. So an X to represent a single specific time is a good way to go. The next type of event that we need to represent somehow is a progressive, continuous, or ongoing event. So this is our continuous aspect. And there's a few different ways that we can represent this visually. Um, the one I like um, is we start with a straight up and down line, but then we just do a squiggly line. So this indicates that the event is ongoing. Another way to represent this is to have a line and then just a straight line with an arrow. Okay. So these are the two clearest ways to indicate we've got this event that's ongoing. Now the final aspect that we need to represent somehow is a little bit more challenging and this is the perfect aspect. If you recall, the perfect aspect links one event usually in the present with an event that happened in the past. So we're linking time somehow. So the easiest way to represent this type of event or this type of action is, I'm going to draw another line here just to um, represent my past and my future. Say, be having to erase it, is to have an event happen, but then to draw an arrow linking it back. Or if it links to the future, I'm going to link it into the future somehow. Or if it happens in the past, but it's important now in the, in the present, I'm going to have an arrow that shows that linkage. So these are the three aspects that we have to visually represent. A specific event, an ongoing event, and, e and an event that somehow links through time. So that's the second thing to put into your timeline. The next thing that we need to represent somehow on our timelines is whether we know when an event takes place or whether we don't know it. So the easiest way if we know it, so for example, I've got a specific event that's already finished and I know when it happened, so I'm going to put that time onto my timeline. I'm going to indicate that I know when this event happened. If I don't know when something happened, I'm just going to put a question mark on top of it. So that tells me I know when this event happened versus I don't know when this event happened. Another piece of information that we might need to put on our timeline is duration. So how long an event takes place over or, or what time lapse we're talking about. Duration is easiest to represent simply by indicating a starting point, 
and then a finishing point, and then putting the time period underneath. So maybe this is 16 years, for example. Okay, so this tells me I've got some kind of duration going on. We can also use color in our timelines to make things jump out. So the background of our timeline is black on white, so if I even just use color for a single event, that event really jumps out. So if I want to uh, illustrate he called last night, I'm going to use orange to make a bright orange cross or X on my timeline, and then I'm going to label the event as called. So that jumps out much more than if I just used black. Okay? However, I can also use color if I've got two events happening at the same time, and I want to illustrate those two events and have them uh, easily distinguished one from the other. So if I've got the sentence, um, he called while I was eating dinner. So I've got two events, he called and me eating dinner. So I've already got he called on there, and that's in orange, so I'm going to use green for um, eating dinner. So I don't actually know when I started eating dinner, but I do know that it was going on when he called. Okay, So I'm using my green to illustrate the second action that happened in this sentence. So these are two ways to use color. One simply to get it to jump out, and then the second way is to contrast two events happening at the same time. And just a couple of final quick tips for making timelines to remember. The first one is uh, pretty obvious, but it's important to remember. Try to make sure that your lines are straight. I have a tendency, unfortunately, to make my lines go up this way. Um, so I always have to be careful when I'm making timelines that I've actually got straight lines up and down. And the second thing to keep in mind is make sure that your words and your labeling is big enough so that students right at the back of your class can actually read it. So there's no point in having this little teeny tiny timeline if your students at the back can't read it. So two final tips to keep in mind. Take a look at each of the verb tenses in turn and how we might represent those verb tenses on a timeline. It's really important to remember that we've got form when it comes to our verb tenses, so how we make them, and then we've got use, how we use them or why we use them. Timelines illustrate the use. They obviously don't illustrate the form. So sometimes with verb tenses we actually have multiple timelines because we use those verb tenses in different ways. And simple present is an excellent illustration of this. Simple present is quite simple to make, but it is actually more difficult to learn in terms of its use. And we actually have to use multiple timelines to illustrate the multiple uses of simple present. We obviously wouldn't teach all of these timelines to our students all at once, but as a teacher, we need to know them. I'm just going to do a few of the timelines for simple present and I'm going to leave you to figure out the rest. So simple present is most often used to talk about habit or routine. So these are things that I do often or frequently or rarely and so on. So how do we represent this visually on a timeline? It's not an event that happens now, it doesn't happen in the past and it doesn't happen in the future. So what do we do? Because we can't just have a single event here, or a single event here, or a single event here. Because this doesn't capture the idea that we do this over and over again. What we do is we put multiple events at regular intervals to illustrate. So for example, every morning I eat yogurt for breakfast. So I do it in the past, I did it in the past, I do it now, and I probably will do it in the future. So every morning I eat yogurt for breakfast. So these X's at regular intervals illustrate the usage of simple present, I eat yogurt every day. So I'm going to put my sentence up here. I eat yogurt every day. And then I've illustrated it with my events happening at regular intervals. We also use the simple present for general truths. So, for example, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. 
we can actually illustrate this exactly the same way on our timeline because every single day the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So we've got this event happening all the time across our three um, pieces of time, past, present, and future. So we can use it for general truths as well. So the sun rises every day in the east, for example. Okay, so this is how we can illustrate a general truth. The same thing if we want to talk about the temperature that water boils at, or um, what things are made of, and so on. It doesn't matter. As long as it's a general truth, we can illustrate it the same way, because every time this event happens, it happens the same way. Another use of the simple present is to talk about a regularly scheduled event. For example, the train leaves at 7.30 p.m. So I'll put that up here. The train leaves at 7.30 p.m. And this is a regular event, so probably tomorrow the train leaves at 7.30 p.m., tonight it leaves at 7.30 p.m., probably last night it left at 7.30 p.m. as well. So I'm going to illustrate it, first of all, by putting my main event there. So it's not 7.30 p.m. yet, but when 7.30 p.m. comes around, that train is leaving. And probably the night after, at 7.30 p.m., the train's leaving again. And probably yesterday, the train left at 7.30 p.m., and probably the day before, the train also left at 7.30 p.m. So this is how we would illustrate simple present to talk about a regularly scheduled event that is coming up soon. So the train leaves at 7.30 p.m. One last simple present use that I like that I'll illustrate um, as a timeline because this really shows the power of timelines is using simple present for sports commentary. So if you're Canadian, you're very familiar with he shoots, he scores. And this is any commentary that tells listeners the exact events happening right now. So this would go right here. So this exact moment in time, he shoots. And then at the ex next exact moment in time, he scores. So this is a really interesting use of the simple present. For commentary, he shoots. And then he scores. This is placing these events at this exact moment in time. So this is simple present for ongoing sports commentary. These are just a few examples of using timelines to illustrate some of the uses of the simple present. There are more, as I mentioned, so try those on your own. Figure out timelines for the other uses of the simple present. The next verb tense that we'll look at is the simple past. This one's a little bit easier than the simple present because there are not quite as many different usages of the simple past. So generally we use the simple past to talk about a single finished event that occurred in the past at a specific time. And this is very simple to show on a timeline. So here's my event and then above that I'm going to put the time at which the event happened. So I watched a movie last night. So that's my sentence. I watched a movie last night. Okay, so here's my event watched and then my time that I'm going to label is last night. So a single event that happened in the past, it's complete and it happened at a specified time last night. There are a couple of other interesting uses of simple past that we can illustrate with a timeline as well. So one of them is actually a habit or routine in the past. So we've already seen the simple present to describe an ongoing habit, but we can use the simple past to use to describe a habit that occurred in the past. So for example, um, if I have a sentence, I studied French when I was in high school or I studied French in high school. Let's make it a bit simpler, because it's pretty obvious I'm not in high school anymore. So I studied French 
in high school. My writing's getting worse here. So I'm going to put an event here and my time frame is in high school. Okay, and I studied French. So I don't study French anymore, but back in the past when I was in high school, I studied French. Another way that I could possibly illustrate this, let me just grab another marker here, is I might want to show a little bit of a time span. So instead of using an X, I'm going to use a duration and I'm going to label that duration in high school. So this shows me that it's not a single point in time, but a time span. Okay, so we can choose two different ways to illustrate I studied French in high school. And we'll look at one last use of the simple past. We can have a series of events in the past that occurred one after the other, and they're all finished. So for example, last night I finished work, I ate dinner, and then I watched TV. So I finished work, I ate dinner, and then I watched TV. So I finished work, ate dinner, and watched TV. So I've got event number one, finished work, event number two, ate dinner, and event number three, watched TV. So I can use the simple past for this series of completed events in the past. Now let's take a look at the simple future. Remember with the simple future we have two choices. We have the simple future using will and the simple future using going to. For these examples I'm just going to use will and some of the uses of will are very different from going to and some are the same. So I'm just going to stick to will for this demonstration and you can figure out going to on your own. So the first use of the simple future with will is to make a prediction. So for example, I will finish my degree next year. So I'm predicting based on all the evidence that I will finish my degree next year. So here's my sentence. I will finish my degree next year. Okay, so we're done with the past, so we need to move over to this part of our timeline. And here's my event. It's going to be finishing my degree, and my time is next year. Okay, so that's how I would illustrate that use of the simple future. The next use of the simple future is to make a promise. So, for example, I could say, I will call you tomorrow. So that's my sentence. I will call you tomorrow. Okay, so my event is going to happen tomorrow. So I'm going to label that as tomorrow. And the action that will happen is to call. So this is an illustration of a timeline for the future simple to make a promise. And we'll do one more example of the simple future. And this one is offering or volunteering to do something. So let's say the phone is ringing and I'm sitting really close to the phone. So I say, I'll get it or I will get it. So here's my sentence, I'll get it, okay? That means this one is going to be pretty close to now because right now the phone is ringing and I don't want to ring I don't want it ringing for too long. So my event's going to happen right here. So I will get the phone. Okay, and it's really close to now. So this is an example of volunteering to do something that's that needs doing right in the immediate future. So these are some examples of the simple future and the timelines that would go with them. There are other uses of the simple future, uh, both for will and going to, so try those ones by yourself. Now we're going to move on to another aspect. So we've looked at the simple aspect, now we're gonna look at the continuous or the progressive aspect. 
So we're going to start with simple continuous or simple progressive. So this is a type of event that's ongoing, and we want to convey to our listener that this is an ongoing event, and then we need to visually represent it with our timeline. So right now, I am talking on the phone. Okay, so my sentence is, I am talking on the phone. So how do I represent this? Well, it's an event that's happening right now, so it gets a big X in the now, but it, we don't really know when it started and we don't know when it finished, so if we want, we can also use our wiggly line to indicate that this is an ongoing action. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways we can do this. We can do it just with a big X in the middle, or we can do it with both an X and a wiggly line, or if you want, you can just do it with a wiggly line going through now. So I am talking on the phone. A few different ways we can represent that. Our next verb tense is another continuous one, and this is the past continuous. And we use the past continuous we want, when we want to indicate something was going on when another event happened, possibly interrupting it. So how do we represent this one visually? So for example, I was eating dinner when he called. So my present continuous is I was eating dinner. So I was eating dinner when he called. Okay. So my past continuous is I was eating dinner. So we don't really know when it started, but we know that it was happening. We don't know when it finished either. So if I want, I can put little question marks here. Okay, so that is my was eating dinner. Okay, and then while that was happening, something else happened. Hang on, I'm just gonna get another color marker. And so I was eating dinner and then Boom, right in the middle of that, he called. Okay, so this shows that we've got two events happening. One is ongoing, and then one happened right in the middle of it. If we want to make it even clearer, we can actually label these. So, I was eating dinner. I'm going to label as event number one. And he called. I'm going to label as event number two. So this makes it even clearer to my students that I've got two events going on. One is ongoing and then one happens right in the middle. And our future continuous is fairly similar to our past continuous except instead of happening in this part of our timeline it happens over here. So I'm going to use a similar sentence. So we will be eating dinner when you arrive. So we've got two events. Okay, so I'm going to label my events first. So we will be eating dinner is event number one. And I'm going to use my blue, just about to drop my markers there, for event number two. Okay. And my ongoing event, because it's got the future continuous, is eating dinner. So I don't know when it started, okay, but it's ongoing. And I don't know when it's going to finish, but I know that it covers some type of time span. So this is my first event, eating dinner, and I'm going to label that as event number one. Then event number two happens. You decided you're going to arrive at my house at six o'clock and you've told me that and I warn you, look, we will be eating dinner when you arrive. So you arrive right here. That's event number two. That is your arrival. So this is a way to illustrate the future continuous using a timeline. Now we're moving on to one of the trickier verb tenses in English. This is the present perfect. 
and it's tricky because there are, similar to the simple present, there's actually a lot of different uses of the present perfect. And I'm just going to give you a few of them as examples, and then you can try making timelines for the other ones on your own. So we use the present perfect very generally in order to indicate that an event happened in the past at an unspecified time, and somehow that's important to the conversation we're having today, or the position we're in today. So here's an example. Um, I have been to, I have been to France. Okay, this is true actually, it's a great country. Okay, so I have been to France. My present perfect is right here. So I have been to France, okay? And this event happened in the past, but given the information in the sentence, we actually don't know when this happened, okay? So we have to put a question mark here, okay? And then somehow the fact that I have been to France is relevant to what we're talking about right now. So I'm just going to make an arrow to indicate this relevance. So maybe we're talking about um, plans for our upcoming vacation and we can't decide where to go. And you suggest France and I'm like, no, I have been to France. I want to go somewhere else. Or I have been to France and I want to go again. Okay? So somehow it has relevance to our present situation. And the other important thing is we don't know when in the past it happened. So it happened at an unspecified time. Another use of the present perfect is to talk about an event that happened multiple times in the past, and we still don't know when they happened, but this is relevant once again to our conversation right now. So for example, I have seen, and that's our present perfect, I have seen that movie five times. Okay, so I'm going to put it on my timeline. One, two, three, four, five. And we don't know when I saw it, so we're going to have to put question marks here. And we're going to join these together with an arrow to now, because somehow the fact that I've seen this movie five times is relevant to what we're talking about now. So for example, we're trying to decide which movie to see, and you suggest a movie. And then I say, I've seen that movie five times. And I want to see it again, or I don't want to see it again. Okay, so somehow our conversation is relevant to what we're talking about now. So multiple events finished in the past, we don't know when, and relevant to what we're talking about now. And we'll do one more example of the present perfect. I love this verb tense. Yes, I'm a complete grammar geek. Um, and this one illustrates yet another use of the present perfect. So we're going to use the sentence, he hasn't finished his homework yet, okay? So I'm going to write it out. I won't use the contraction. He has not finished his homework yet, okay? So he has not finished. That's my negative present perfect. So we can't actually put this on the timeline because it's not, it's an event that hasn't happened yet. But we can illustrate the expectation that he's going to finish it. So it's not finished yet, but I expect really soon he's going to have it finished. So he's working on his homework, and then he hasn't finished it yet, but he will finish. Okay, so if you want, you can use a squiggly line to illustrate, okay, he started it, and it's not finished yet. Okay, but I expect in the very near future it will be finished. So this is a use of an event not completed, but we expect it to be it to be completed fairly soon or in the immediate future. So here's where it will be finished, and he's working on it right now. So this is a little bit of a different use of the present perfect. Let's take a look at the past perfect. We use the past perfect to place two events in the past in a specific order. So we want to place one event before another event. So for example, um, I can say he had eaten dinner before I arrived. 
Okay, so we've got two events, so I'm just going to grab another marker and let's label them. So we've got event number one, had eaten dinner. And then event number two, I arrived. And event one finishes before event two, so we're just placing one further back in time than the other. So event number one goes here, and event number two goes here. So that's the use of our past perfect. It places one event before another event in the past. I'll show you one more use of the past perfect because it's kind of a fun one. So we can use the past perfect as well to illustrate something happening right up until a second event happens. So for example, um, he had had, I love the had had that can get uh, confusing. He had had the car for 10 years. So that's my duration event um, before he crashed it. Sorry, that's kind of a negative example, isn't it? Okay, so we've got two events. One is a duration event and one is a single event. So our duration event, he had had the car for 10 years. Okay, and then our single event, he crashed it. So how do we put this one on our timeline? So we're gonna have, we don't, we're gonna have our squiggly line to show our duration, okay? And then that hap that occurred right up until he crashed it. I forgot to label my event. So event number two, and then duration number three, we can actually indicate this was 10 years, so that's number one. Okay? So this is another use for this verb tense. We've got a duration which stops with the occurrence of a second event. Now let's take a look at the future perfect. So the future perfect allows us to talk about one event which will occur before a certain point in time in the future. So we're in this part of our timeline. So here's an example sentence. Okay. I will have graduated by April next year. Okay. So we're going to put, we have to do two things here. We have to put our time frame on our timeline. So I'm going to use a straight up line because this is not an event. Okay, but this is April next year. And sometime before that time frame, I will graduate. Okay, so I'm going to, what color am I going to use here? I'm going to use blue. Um, so my graduation, let's say, is going to happen right here. Okay, but I don't really know when. All I know is it's going to be before April next year. So the future perfect allows us to take one event, graduation, put one right here, that happens before a specific point in the future. We can also use the future perfect to place one event before another event in time, but this time in the future. So I'll use the graduation example again. So I will have graduated by the time uh, my parents arrive. Probably not a happy example because parents usually like to see graduation, but that's the one that came to mind. So we've got two events happening. So we've got graduation is event number one, and my parents arriving is event number two. So I need to place these in order in the future. So event number one is going to go before event number two. Okay, so I graduate and then my parents arrive. Not the best timing that we want to have happen. So, and you'll notice that this the parents arrive that's in the simple present. So we've got our future perfect paired with our simple present and it places our two events in time 
in the future. Now we're moving on to the really interesting verb tenses, the perfect plus the progressive. So present perfect progressive, we take two types of action and combine them together somehow to get some really interesting grammar and some interesting timelines. So present perfect progressive, for example, I have been walking for four hours. So I'm gonna put it over here to give me some space. I have been walking for, whoops, the wrong four coming up, for four hours, okay? So there's my present perfect continuous. So how do I put this one on a timeline? I know that the total duration we're talking about is four hours, and that four hours is right up to now. So I'm gonna do a duration thing going on here, and this is four hours, okay? And just to emphasize the fact this has been going on for a long time, I'm gonna put my squiggly line there. So this is my walking. And I also want to put my relevance arrow in here because this is relevant to our conversation somehow. So maybe my friend comes up to me and says, oh, you look really tired. I'm like, yeah, I am tired. I have been walking for four hours. So it's relevant to our conversation right now. The past perfect progressive once again takes two types of actions and puts them together, but this time it's going on in the past. And so what we're doing is we're taking an event with duration attached to it and then putting it before a single event. So we'll use walking again. So I had been walking, we'll make it four hours again, for four hours when I met him. So that's my event number two, when I met him. Okay, so we've got two events going on. We've got our walking, so that's event number one. And then I met him, you'll notice this one's in the simple past. That's event number two. Now, instead of having one event in front of another, we've got a duration in front of another event. So it looks like this. So I've got four hours here. And my event is my walking. And then I've got, so this is event number one, which is all about duration. And then I've got another shorter event happen, I met him, okay? So we take an event with a long duration in progress and we place it before a short event that is, starts and finishes very quickly. So this is the past perfect progressive. Last but certainly not least, we've got the future perfect progressive. So once again, we're taking a progressive ongoing action and pairing it with a completed action, but this time it's all going in the future, but it's relevant to what we're talking about right now. So it gets a little bit complicated. So here's the sentence we're gonna use. We're gonna use the walking thing again. So I will have been walking for four hours. So that's our event number one, and that's our future perfect progressive. Um, when I arrive. So it's gonna take me four hours of walking to get to wherever it is I'm going, your house or some kind of destination. So how do we illustrate this? Oh, we need event number two which is I'm arriving. So we've indicated that in our sentence. So now we're gonna put them on our timelines. So I don't actually know when, when my walking started, but I've got, so I'm gonna have to have some kind of question mark here, but this is four hours. And so we've got four hours of duration and this is our walking, okay? And I'm gonna label that as event number one. And then event number two is I arrive. Okay, so in the future, we've got an ongoing action of duration for four hours, and then something happens after that to interrupt that ongoing action. 
and probably it's relevant somehow to what we're talking about, so it would be a good idea to put this little arrow back to whatever we're talking about right now. So for example, when I meet you, I'm going to be really tired because I will have been walking for four hours when I arrive. So that's the future perfect progressive. So what I've taken you through, first of all, was a series of tips or ideas or techniques for making timelines to illustrate visually the different verb tenses in English so that your students can have a better understanding of those verb tenses. Then I took you through each of the verb tenses in turn and how you could create timelines or what those timelines would look like to illustrate the different uses of those verb tenses. Remember, I did not cover every single use of every single verb tense. So there are some uses of these verb tenses for you to try on your own. Keep timelines in your repertoire when you're teaching grammar. These are an invaluable tool to help students visually understand how to place events in time with the different verb tenses in English. Thank you.